Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in tonight. My name is Chad Radford, and I'm a music writer here in Atlanta, Georgia. Over the last few years, I have teamed up with tonight's host, Acapella Books, to interview everyone from John Doe of the band X and Billy Bragg to Chris France of the Talking Heads. Acapella is an independently owned bookstore in Atlanta with more than 30 years of history. And tonight, I'm speaking with author Robert Gordon, who's celebrating the 25th anniversary edition of his book, it came from Memphis, which arrived this week via Third Man Books. Robert, how are you? I'm good, man. Chad, acapella, thanks for having me on. Very happy to be here. We're happy to have you. So we're going to talk for a little while, and then we'll do a 15-minute Q&A here in just a bit. Um, so if you have any questions that you would like to ask Robert, please ask them in the Q&A box that you see on your screen, not the chat box. If you put them in the chat box, we won't see them, and we definitely do want to hear from you. So please keep that in mind. And before I get started asking questions, Robert is gonna read a, a brief chapter or a brief section from a chapter in the book. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to Robert. All right, we were just uh, riffing before this began about should we open with a reading or not? And um, <laughs> I thought of the dog shit part. So I, a heads up, there's a cuss word ahead. Um, That's right, kids. Oops. <laughs> for the kids. Cover your ears. <laughs> um, this is a section, a little paragraph in the book, and it's talking about the way records get made. And it's referring particular into, uh, about um, a guy named uh, Eddie Bond. And Eddie Bond was a sort of country music, great country music singer, early rockabilly guy, and, and became a hustler. Always had a side gig. And he's the one who discovered uh, or who made Buford Pusser into the walking tall legend that he became. I mean, Buford Pusser did his thing, but Eddie was the one who sort of put it together and sold it. And Jim Dickinson, who's the star of the book, one of the stars of the book, said, um, he's talking about Eddie and, and he said, the, so now I'm going to read from the book. Uh, Eddie thought he had it made, and everybody told him, Eddie, they won't let you keep it. Somebody's going to take it away. And sure enough, Bing Crosby Productions. That was back in, in Memphis. If you had a crooked disc jockey, seriously now, a crooked disc jockey, a drunken brain surgeon, and a used car salesman, you were making a r r record. Those were the elements you needed to record somebody's girlfriend singing some dog shit song and everybody could pay their rent. So did you have a specific song in mind when you, uh, when you were writing this, thinking about dog shit? <laughs> uh, later, um, let's see. Yeah, by this point in time, uh, Tav Falco had already uh, become a presence in Memphis and um, and I forget who he got it from, someone, someone who had come before him, but he was the one who would always say on stage, thank you, we appreciate the dog shit out of it. So uh, it was kind of all in the air thereafter, you know, and it just seemed to work here. Nice, beautiful. Um, <laughs> well, my first question is, I wanna go ahead and start by talking about the photo that appears on the front of the book. Okay, great. Now, in, in my head, um, I have kind of built this up to be like a Rosetta Stone of sorts for this book and for Memphis. Um, so you see uh, Marsha Hare there on the left, which is, that's Misty Lavender. That's yes. her, her, her alias. Her current uh, name, she changed her name. Yeah, I've, I've been Googling her and, and I found, I, I figured that out. Um, but on the right is is sort of an unknown gentleman, and um, so I've been I've been looking at this photo. I've been staring at it pretty hard, trying to figure out uh, kind of what what's going on here. Yeah. And and it connects us to Tab Falco because yeah. he, he owns the photo. He took the photo. Um, uh, William Egglestein, the photographer, shot photos of of Marsha Hare. Yeah. And the grocery store behind them is kind of catty corner to what was the Antenna Club. Is that correct? 
Uh, you're off by a, by a block, but you're in the yeah. right neighborhood. Yeah. And, and it's pretty close to where. Yeah, it, yeah it, interesting. Go, man. I hadn't gone here. Keep making the connections. I'm loving it. It's pretty close to where the Bitter Lemon was, correct? Uh, you know, on a bicycle, yeah. Okay. So it's sort of like this photo. There's all these threads that you can pull into different points of history uh, for Memphis. And uh, so I just wanted to bring it up. And um, I wanted to ask, what, what, what did you have in mind when, when you chose this to be the photo for the cover? Well, I have um, kind of interesting stories about the covers of, of each of my books. You know, when I dreamed of being an, 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 an author, I didn't know that like I would have, you know, stories about the covers of each of my books. This one, actually, I sent a bunch of photos to Third Man Books and Chet, uh, my editor, said, uh, why don't we use this one? And I thought, it, I hadn't thought of it as a cover photo, honestly. But as soon as he said it, I thought it was a genius idea. And, and the thing that attracted me to it was I figured these were two basically unknown characters to the public. Visually, it's not Bruce Springsteen, you know. This is not someone people know immediately just by, uh, you know, visual recognition. So I loved that it was um, kind of an, an, an affront to the Southern gentility and, and that this was, you know, this was Southern gentility's nightmare, an African-American man and a, and, a, and a white woman, you know, arms around each other. And so I loved, I loved that. And I think uh, Marsha being, you know, one of the key characters in the book and she's so beautiful um and i love that it's a zare that's behind there and i shopped you know my parents would uh take me to buy albums or i would go buy albums when i was dragged to the zare um you know so it would it all fit together nice yeah I would, and i actually wanted to bring that up is that that does it does kind of say something about this uh, element of, of race relations that you have in the book. Yeah. It seems like from, from even from the, the first chapter, uh, the, the kids and the people who were involved in the music scene, the culture scene, the pro wrestling, were very much about tearing down those barriers between black and white, mm -hmm. which was kind of an anomaly for the South. Me Memphis kind of stood apart. And, uh, and that, that kind of projected that yeah, 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 yeah. And Memphis is about, you know, Memphis is the renegade town where Nashville is the corporate town. Memphis is where people, you know, come to do what they can't do in Nashville. Memphis is where the free thinkers go. And so um, there's always been a really kind of conspicuous battle, more so in modern times, you know, since the rock and roll era, since the 1950s on, between the surface of the town, the, uh, you know, the founding fathers, and they're uh, raised on cotton and racist views versus the kids from the 50s on who were saying, wait a minute, man, I like what you're telling me not to like, you know, I, I respect uh, what you're telling me not to respect. And it took that kind of free independent thinking for rock and roll to happen like it did. Very cool. So I mean, this is essentially a book about characters. I mean, when it comes to like a lot of music biographies, you often see writing focus on like the adventures of specific musicians or things like that. And, and as I read this, uh, I feel like the landscape, like Memphis, West Memphis, Midtown, all these different places are, are the main character of the book. And, and these people whose stories you're telling kind of are what make it work. Um, is that sort of what you set out to accomplish when you put it together? You know, what I set out to accomplish, I can't verify. You know, I'd have to really think about what it was. Here's the thing, and I, and I think it's important, you know, it's a first book. And so, well, and actually, you know, for the writers out there, I had already written two full-length books, uh, novels actually, which I never tried to publish because they were so crappy, but it taught me a lot about the long form, the way to write in a long form 
manner, you know. So, but this was the first published book, and um, and I I don't think that a more experienced author would do it the way I did it. Uh, I <laughs> I'll tell you this. Well, what did I try to accomplish? You know, this was just kind of the world I I grew up in. And, and as I began to write this book, I began to research the roots of the world I grew up in. And that's what the book is. I look at it as, you know, if you've read the book and you know the group, or if you've heard the group Mud Boy and the Neutrons, Bob Dylan called them the greatest unknown band. You know, when he met Jim Dickinson, who he used on the record, uh, Time Out of Mind, he said, yeah, you know, what do you say? Uh, that's the group that nobody can find. And, and, uh, and so in a way, the book is a quiet biography of Mud Boy and the Neutrons, these four musicians slash non-musicians who created music as a conversation, you know, using traditional uh, songs. That's kind of the thing. And, and so as I understood them, I understood them as how the blues musicians, the older blues musicians, handed off the blues playing mantle to the younger white guys, the sort of post beatnik pre hippie guys. And that's mud boy to me. So that uh, what I see the book about is kind of how the aura of Memphis that was established by the old bluesmen in the 1920s got handed to the young uh, proto hippies of the 1960s and how the racial collision involved in that extended like a jazz song you know just it, over time there are there are many many steps along the way in that handoff from that yeah. generation to that generation yeah which, and, uh, and, and no one you know there wasn't a book i used to go into bookstores and i would uh check the inde indexes of of music books looking for uh, Alex Chilton and Jim Dickinson, Big Star, Panther Burns, Furry Lewis, you know, Uther Turner, and th none of this stuff was there. So I figured I'll write the book about it. You know, that's kind of where it came from. I wanted a book with an index I would really like. <laughs> nice. That kind of brings, like, like, that kind of already answers the next question that I had, but. I wanted to ask if there was like a moment in your life when you kind of had an epiphany and realized that you wanted to be the keeper of, of this side of Memphis, like the underdogs, so to speak. I remember um, when, quite honestly, I remember when my friend, and I'm you know so honored and pleased to call him a friend, Peter Guralnik turned to me and said, you know, how, how does it feel to be the, the chosen one was the one he said, you know, the guy who's going to be the keeper of these stories. And like, it, it was never my goal. I hadn't intended to be it. I just, it's just what I was interested in, you know? I just like, that's the great thing about like making uh, books and films is you, you, it, you know, some of them you do for hire, but the ones you really love, you do them because you're really interested in the subject and you want to know more. And that's what this was. And, the, and I think the exuberance of my learning uh, about the roots of this scene, Dewey Phillips and Sputnik Monroe, and you know the racial collisions that preceded the ones I knew growing up in Memphis. Um, I was really interested. The exuberance of my learning about that kind of comes across in the pages. Nice, you're writing it as you learn it. <laughs> yes, somewhat, and trying to preserve that excitement. Right. Well, more than 25 years have passed now since this book first came out in uh, in 95 um and now that you have the advantage of so much hindsight uh what realizations have you had about memphis and about the book uh since you wrote it well the i i i had a I, I, from the time the book was published people would come up to me and say man this book really changed my life and i mean as a writer, what more do you want to hear? You know, right. actually, the thing I like to hear the most is, I I, I would uh, read it to my spouse in bed, and we'd both laugh. That's my favorite. You know, and I've gotten it really a lot. So I love that. You know, but uh, um, when I went back to it after twenty five years, 
I never had understood like what was so life changing about it. And again, because I'm writing about the world I knew and having that distance over time, I realized that it helps redefine personal success. You know, Mudboy and the Neutrons hit a grand slam every time they performed. And there might have been, you know, I was one of 12 in, in the audience, many a show. You know, and they and it and it wasn't about how big is the audience, right. and and so I think the book and Big Star, you know, here it is, what fifty years later, and Big Star's a success, and in its time, you know, no one knew them, and yet they made they pers per persisted, and I think that that's what the book is is about. It lets you it it says be true to your art kind of in nice. a way. Was it was it difficult uh, after having so much experience and in and winning awards, doing what you do, writing books, making films, to go back and look at the look at your writing 25 years ago and think, I've come so far since then. I'm happy to say it was not. <laughs> you know, yeah. I was glad I was really glad, you know. I had read the book. The the book came out on Favor and Favor in 1995. At some point, like 2000, 2001 or something, uh, Simon & Schuster picked it up. Favor & Favor, let it go. Simon & Schuster immediately picked it up. And that's where it's been all, all this time. And when Simon & Schuster picked it up, I reread it and wrote a new introduction. So that was like 20 years. You know, I'd read it within the past, you know, 18, 20 years. Yeah. And so having gone back to it once and been pleased, I expected to go back pleased again, which was probably a, 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 you know, I'm glad my expectation was realized because many a time I've gone back to a book I loved and been so disappointed. But no, I, I felt good about it. I did. Right. Good, good. So you, you won a Grammy for yeah. the liner notes that you wrote in Big Star's box set. Right. Um, Keep an eye on the sky. So I, you know, I was wondering, can you relive a little bit uh, for us meeting Alex Chilton and uh, and Jody and, and kind of getting into Big Star? Well, I got into Big Star. Okay, great. We'll go deep for a minute on Big Star. Um, I got into Big Star backwards. I got into the third album, then okay. the second album, and then the first album. I was in high school when uh, 1977, I think, or eight, something like that. And uh, and it was unlike anything I'd heard. And it had, you know, it was kind of, uh, it's a depressive album, but it's a, an exuberant album. And what it really is an album about is about, and I didn't realize it, you know, until way later, but it's The Edge. It's about uh, living on the edge and, um, and, and it's harrowing, that album. So uh, at that point in time, Alex was playing around in Memphis in a band called Panther Burns. And I'd been to early Panther Burns gigs and knew who he was more as the vocalist of the box tops. I guess I'd, yeah, and, and right, Big Star Third. And so I didn't, and then it was hard to find <laughs> the records, you know, there was no internet. Uh, it was hard to find the album. So I remember finding big, the, the, Radio City record in, in college, you know, at a, at, a, at a used record store. And I guess I already knew it because I ran home to my roommates and played them September Girls. So I don't know, you know. Alex and Alex was into punk and punkabilly and, and stuff when I knew, when I began to see him personally. And um, it was really, you know, he and Dickinson are kind of the through characters in the book because they take us from, uh, well, J starting with Jim and Jim's influence on Alex and then Alex. They take us from the early raw blues to, uh, you know, the post-punk wild world. Right. So do you remember meeting him? Meeting Alex the first time? Well, I remember uh, one time he came over to dinner. 
Oh yeah. Okay. Here it is. What, what I what I what I what I what I remember is I was doing I was making a a documentary for Ardent Ardent Records and had gotten into uh, video production when video came out and um, and I and I was ma making a documentary for them called Memphis Fallout and a whole bunch of the interviews in the book are transcripts from interviews I'd done at that time and. Uh, and, and so I was at Arden, I'd met Alex some way and he introduced me to someone else. That's what I, re I remember. And, and I remember, oh, he likes me, you know? That was when, that, it was the brief period when he liked me. Um, later at Arden, he asked me my birth date and then and I told him, you know, and he didn't like me. And so, um, you know, we had a kind of vexed uh, relationship, you know, that, notion about journalists being parasites. Um, he made me really feel like a parasite. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, along the same lines, let me let me ask the question again, but uh, let's talk about Tav Falco. How did you get to know Tav Falco? Again, the Antenna Club, you know, Tav Falco's Panther Burns. The first time I went to talk to Tav, so I don't know, you know, I don't know if you can tell, I stutter. I stuttered really bad when I was much younger. And so I remember going to Ta Tav was, you know, they were, Tav had played the, the all girl band, the clits had opened. Uh, Tav had played, it was going up on stage. I approached him, you know, like over at the side, there was not really a backstage, sort of a backstage at the antenna. There was a side area, I approached him and I started talking to him. And one of the clits came over and threw a Heineken bottle at him and he ducked and it smashed on the concrete wall behind him. And I'd never gotten my question out of my throat and I left, you know, I was like, man, meow, you know. So uh, eventually uh, we became friendly more through film because I found, I came home, I, I got access to a Bolex camera some kind of way. I think the first day me and Tab hung out, I brought a crank Bolex camera with 16 millimeter film and he had a, uh, boy, he's going to kill me for not knowing the car, the model. I think it was a, uh, like a black Lincoln or something. And uh, it wound up dying when we were doing this little shoot and that we were making up as we went. And they wound up having to push it. And I'm down here with this crank Bolex and this car is coming by me and the front door is open because someone's got to you know, be there to push and steer. And the <laughs> door whacked the head over and held the camera. My friend Trey Harrison was there, a photographer. Uh, and he wasn't my friend. I was meeting him that day, but he was a photographer. I have the Bolex. I rolled with the Bolex and he grabbed it from me and turned it on me. And there's a shot in this little film of me with like a bad cut right here in my eye and blood coming down my head. And that's how I met Tab. Super realism. <laughs> yeah, you know, I know Tab mostly through his records, but uh, he is a filmmaker as well. And I know that the two of you have been friends for a long time. So yeah. do, you, do you think of his work a, as an influence on what you do? Mm. One of the greatest things Tav ever said was, um, I think of the guitar as a Kodak Instamatic camera. You just pick it up and play, right? Those old Kodak Instamatic cameras were made so that you didn't have to know anything about photography. You just picked it up and clicked. And, 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 and the bravery of doing that was very influential on me. Yeah, just saying, hell man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it my way, you know? And that's, what, that's what, what worked. And in a way, that's what you did with, it came from Memphis. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, more, the more I read it, like I, I get deeper and deeper into it and I have to stop and ask myself, wait, who, who is speaking in the first person here? Oh, yeah, <laughs> it's you. <laughs> Um, which again, you don't get that with a lot of sort of musical biographies or whatever. I don't, I, but I don't even, I went into this thinking it was a music biography, but it's, it's different. It's, uh, you know. It's a cultural, it's a cultural story about mm. how the races interacted under Jim Crow and exchanged information in secret. Right. It's a very impressionistic book. You know, I definitely feel a sense of, uh, I get, I get that, that feeling of, of what Memphis is all about. I'm, it makes me miss Memphis uh, <laughs> when I read it. 
one one of my abiding thoughts while I wrote it, you know, was um, a lot of my friends at the time were in bands, and I wanted them to be able to pick up the book at a random page and open to, you know, and be able to find the start of a paragraph and go up one or down one and be able to read a story. Like I'm riding down the highway, hey guys, check this out, you know, and, and, and be able to go, you know, start reading to their friends and it would work. So impressionistic, yes, but also very much a book of stories, you know, storytelling and connecting stories. That's what I really, I laid out on the floor of my office at that time, uh, my, you know, which was my girlfriend, now wife and I lived in Midtown and the other, it was the other bedroom. I just laid out on the floor a series of index cards and that's the way I wrote the book, you know. I kind of organized the index cards and then just put it together. Which is, it's interesting that it starts where it starts with, you know, you talk about Dewey Phillips mm -hmm. being this really chaotic DJ. Yeah. Uh, I, I went through and found some YouTube videos of, of Dewey's broadcasts and uh, it, he talks over records. Yeah. He, he pulls up records in the middle of a song and, and it's like, he's that not ain't feeling gonna it. going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and from there you go into the story of Sputnik Monroe. Okay who is a pro wrestler uh -huh. uh, it, and it, it kind of is an illustration I, I bring this up all the time but this idea uh i believe it was isaac newton who said energy can't be destroyed it can only be redirected mm -hmm. and you see it going from this mush mouth dj over to this gigantic and very imposing professional wrestler into uh into the hippies mm -hmm. <laughs> and into the into the psychedelic scene it's the mental spirit, man. You're exactly right, Chad. You've nailed it. <laughs> and it's and it's a it's a beautiful thing. And the more I read it, I kept sort of going back to previous chapters just to sort of strengthen my own sort of thoughts on this. And it's there. I mean, there there's a very clear thread of this same energy that's woven throughout all of these different people's lives. Well, that's really interesting. I'm really glad to hear it. And the Sputnik story, you know. That was well before my time. Mm -hmm. So Dickinson told me that, you know, and one day I'm at Sam Phillips recording service, uh, talking to Jerry Phillips, Sam. Jerry says, well, as my friend Sputnik Monroe would say, and I was like, wait a minute. I stopped him, you know, I was like, wait a minute. Sputnik Monroe is alive? And he said, oh, yeah, he's in Houston. I talked to him last week. I was like, Jerry. And Jerry was known as, uh, Jerry's pre-rock and roll Jerry was a professional wrestler when he was 14. And he was known as the world's most perfectly formed midget wrestler. Right. Because he was a 14-year-old kid. Right. And, and, you know, and that was the, that was Sputnik's hustle. Uh, that, you know, to get the crowd mad. The crowd's going, you know, he ain't a midget. He's just a kid. That's not a <laughs> midget. And uh, and so Jerry took me, Jerry and I flew to Houston and met Sputnik Monroe, spent a day, you know, like six hours in a motel room interviewing him and had a blast and became friends with him thereafter. Because the the book and, and an article I published in the LA Weekly about it, about Sputnik, you know, it kind of brought some new attention to him. And so we became friends and, and he hung around. But yeah, that was the great thing. He appealed as a public figure, you know, professional wrestling being, you know, right there with politics and basketball in Memphis. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Sputnik's uh, innovation was to appeal to the black audience and to become their hero, uh, white though he was. And, and by respecting the audience that uh, the culture despised, um, Sputner, Sputnik built up a big, big following. And he, they were, they were uh, confined to the top, you know, hottest area of the public auditorium. And Sputnik said, oh no, man, I'm gonna walk. If you don't open up the lower level 
and let my people in, I'm going to walk. And by doing that, Sputnik, you know, used his power of popularity to integrate the uh, Memphis Civic buildings. Which is a fascinating thing to think about. That's how integration began in Memphis was through professional wrestling. Maybe not began, you know, but that's how, that's how, you know, I mean, I don't know where it began, but that's how the civic buildings in a major way became integrated and kind of to a point where there was no turning back. Right. It's amazing, right? Professional <laughs> wrestling, fake wrestling, you know, brought us uh, integration. There needs to be a plaque of Sputnik Monroe somewhere in the city. Man. <laughs> so how did the, uh, how did you get involved with Third Man Books for this, uh, this new edition? The guy who runs Third Man Books, Chet Wiesa, he's from Memphis. And um, I met him through a Memphis writer named Andrea Lyle. And I don't know, we kind of hit it off. And oddly, you know, the sort of long version of the short story is he said he wanted to do a book and I'd always wanted to do a book of essays. My initial conception of it came from Memphis was a series of interconnected essays because I was really into interviewing Sid Salvage and Jim Dickinson, the people who were Mudboy and the Neutrons, you know, and I wanted to build this thing that interwove. And so he approached me, let's do a book. And I was like, oh yeah, man, we'll do some essays. I got to get out of my contract, you know, my, my next book contract with, uh, after the Stacks book with Bloomsbury. So I said, they'll never buy a book of essays. Let me pitch it to them. They'll reject it and me and you can do it. So they bought it and <laughs> called Memphis Rent Party. And I love it. You know, I yeah. love it. It's exactly the book I wanted it to be. And it's, it's a real bookend companion to it came from Memphis. So poor third man books, you know, proposed this idea and got it stolen from them. And, uh, and eventually I realized, hey, you know, it came from Memphis looks terrible because Simon Schuster was printing it on lightning press, which is this sort of instant, it, lo it looks like a photocopy with low on toner. And, and, and I got the rights back from them and I went to third man and said, hey, let's do this. And they were into it and here, we, and like, you know, the thing I loved was I really wanted it to look good. I wanted the photos to look good and I didn't want it to look like it had been looking for the last 10 or 15 years. And it looks great. You know, Jack White's design, I just felt, I do photos. No repeats, everybody, no repeats. Well, I wanted to ask, how did you go about rounding up 80 new photos for a book? Not hard, <laughs> man. If you've made your life sort of rooting around in people's closets in Memphis, 80 new photos, when do you want them? <laughs> <laughs> great, great. Um, so you have a chapter towards the end called Memphis in the Meantime. Yeah. And uh, there's another one called More Reading, uh, Watching and Listening. Okay. And, you know, one thing, as I was writing this book, I had to keep like a notebook close by because uh, there are so many names and so many things. And I'm like, I need to hear that. I have yeah. to go track that. I've never heard of it. I need to track that down. Cool. So, uh, you know, there's that, it's, it's, there's a buying guide that you have kind of put together. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I wanted to bring that up and sort of ask why was that important to you to uh, sort of go there? Well, it was especially important for this edition of the book because 25 years ago, you know, I kind of wrote it looking for this stuff. And in that 25 years, Big Star, for example, has gone from a completely unknown band to a band that's appeared on... Um, you know, The Tonight Show and, uh, and, and done all these things, you know, there's songs about them and people know who they are and there's books and uh, this whole world has kind of, the whole world that this, I, I, I like to believe that the spirit of this world, of this book still exists in a shadowed area. I feel, I, you know, I shined a light down, I took my flashlight and shined it in the shadowy area and that's what this book is to share the story. But that shadowy area still exists and has and and lots of people have it have gotten into it and rounded up things I never knew about and never heard of. And so I've learned tons. 
and I was very interested in making, you know, helping people who were interested in this kind of thing, interested in artists who make their own way in the world, you know, critics be damned, um, and, and artists who, uh, who work with traditions and bend them to modern needs in innovative, and artistic ways, you know, I, I wanted to share as much of that as I could. And really, I was kind of shocked. I mean, I, I forget how many pages that back section is for, you know, additional reading, but like, it's time. It was times. It was yeah. a lot. It's a lot. There's a lot of new info back here for, you know, for finding stuff you're interested in. Right, right. Memphis has always been kind of a special place for me. Just um... From a, from a punk rock perspective, uh, you know. Yeah, okay, why? Well, I, I, was, I always loved uh, Jay Riotard's records. Yeah. Um, there's a group called Knots that I really love from Memphis. Goner Records is one of my favorite record stores on the planet. Cool. Uh, and, and specifically because if you go there and you look at their 45s, or if you look at their, they have a Memphis section. Like it's a record store that's, that is very much aware of Memphis's history. And if you ask for a Panther Burn 7-inch, they can direct you right to it. Whereas opposed to most record stores that are still around today, there's a little more chaos in the, uh, in the 45s. Um, but I've always, I've always particularly loved Goner. That whole Cooper Young neighborhood is one of my favorites. Uh -huh. um, Goner? Well, th that's very interesting you say all that because the new chap, in, the, in addition to this buying guide we talked about, there's a new last chapter of the book kind of, Tra tracing that spirit we talked about. If the book is a biography of that spirit, where's that spirit been in the past 25 years? And um, interestingly, a number of places, Bar DK, DC, and Goner especially, show up as like prongs in that last chapter to, to ground us in where the scene, in, the scene ended up and where it lives today. Um, and 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 the goner spirit, you know, you lots of these the knots you mentioned the knots who have records on goner. They're mentioned in the in the in the uh, buying guide. You know, that's all kind of all that kind of contemporary stuff. I'm I really like that goner puts out the the Harlan T Bobo albums. Right, you know, Harlan's just a great songwriter, and I think a great singer and guitarist, and I and and one of the live artists see because he brings so much innovation to his show and uh and goner puts them out so you know uh they're proper due both in the chapter of what's gone on in the past 25 years and the binder right harlan is uh he's from france is that correct no 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 he's i don't know where he's from somewhere around here i believe um but then uh met a woman from france here and they wound up moving. She ran like a, her family runs an ice cream store on a you know summer beach somewhere, and he ran. He would go back there and work the ice cream store in the warm months, and come back here and make records in the cold months. Living the life. <laughs> <laughs> so what's uh, what's next for you? What do you have uh, coming up next? Man, you know, uh, I've. I've got, I don't know, a dozen, you know, things about to land. Uh, I think the one that's going to land next is going to be a documentary film about the Newport Folk Festival. Okay. Uh, the Newport Folk Festival, 1963 to 1966. That's what I'm anticipating. And it uses, uh, you know, I'm going to draw a guy, a filmmaker made a film called Festival in 1968 from footage he shot 1963 to 1966. He shot about 100 hours of footage. His movie was Academy Award nominated and he used 90 minutes of footage. So I'm gonna delve into the other 98 and a half hours of footage and see if I can't find another worthy 90 minutes. And I, I'm also very interested in the folk movement because it comes together, you know, in 1963, 
it's just coalescing. In 1964, it becomes, you know, a major force. And in 1965, it explodes into oblivion. And in 1966, it continued, it kind of hobbles along, but in a good way. So I love, I, I love the idea, I love the idea of a movement that coalesces and explodes that fast. So I'm doing audio only interviews, even before COVID, you know, I was doing audio only interviews <laughs> because I want to, I want to immerse my, I want to immerse the viewer in the time period by kind of staying at the festival visually and supplementing the audio with some commentary about and context about what's going on uh, socially and musically. So I think that's going to be the next thing. Very cool. uh, you know, we could all be surprised. Talk about impressionism. That's yeah, uh, exactly. It's very impressive. It is. There you go. That's impressionistic. So cool. All right. Well, we can go ahead and move on from here and start the Q&A section of, of right. tonight. Uh, remember, everybody, if you want to ask a question, uh, please put your questions in the Q&A box that you see down at the bottom of the screen. Not the chat box. The chat box is turned off. And, and we won't see it if it goes there. Um, so let's see what we've got here. Um, so um, I guess Tori, Tori Arnold has made more of a comment uh, than a question Great. and says, uh, like flies on dog shit. I mean, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Which we all know is an Alex Chilton joke. Yes, yes. I will say that of uh, the Alex Chilton albums, uh, Like Flies on Sherbert, is, you know, here was my, here was my Like Flies on Sherbert story. Okay. I, 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 I was, you know, the, the local music critic in the Daily Newspaper, all hail the Daily Newspaper, all hail the local music critic, um, what was, turned me on to Muddy Waters, you know, and turned me on to this new Alex Chilton record called Like Flies on Sherbert. So I went to Pop Tunes, where you could listen to the record before you bought it. And I dropped the needle down and I heard Alex bumping into the microphone, you know, that kind of, that, that thunk sound. And I'm like, wow, man, he bumped into the microphone and they kept it on the record. And then this other like, you know, equally uh, iconoclastic, um, you know, statement on the record. And I was like, hell, I'm not buying that album. This guy, you know, and so, and I, I, I left the store without it. And I don't know, four months later, three months later, I was back at the store begging the clerk, look at in the back, you gotta have another copy somewhere. And he comes <laughs> back, you know, 15 minutes later and says, I found one more copy. And, and, and that, and, and it took that appreciation. I was like, you know, thinking about it over time, he bumped into the microphone and he kept it. And I was like, oh, nobody does that. How great is that? You know, my, my initial offense at the uh, rough aesthetic of like Flies on Sherbert turned, and not immediately, but turned over time into, oh, I realize what, what, what he's doing and saying. You know, it was modern art is what it was. You know, it was exactly, it was, it was exactly what it was. And I went back and just embraced it. I think that that giving it time to sink in is kind of an important part of those Alex Chilton records. And I mean, to push it even further, um, Chris Bell's record, I Am the Cosmos, is one that I kind of struggled with in the very beginning. Um, li like you, I have a story of being in Shangri-La Records in Memphis uh -huh. and, and asking about Big Star and uh, them kind of telling me, you don't, want, you don't need any more Big Star records, you need this Chris Bell record. <laughs> like it had just been reissued at the time, it was many years ago. And he's like- Like a disc uh, reissued, right? Yeah. Yep. And he's, he's like, this is better than anything Big Star ever did. And I was like, well, I need to hear this. And, and took it home and, 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 you know, kind of with that expectation, just thinking like, I, what is going, this is like a suicide record. <laughs> this is insane. Uh, but, but over time, it, 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 it hit me like what a beautiful sentiment that record is. And, uh, I've, I've kind of reapproached all of their records kind of with that same headspace of just give this some time and let it sink in. It's not, it's not going to hit you immediately. 
Yeah, you know, it's funny, like both Big Star and Robert Johnson, the blues singer, the, I realized that the songs I initially liked would, even as I liked them, as I started to appreciate the other ones, I realized, oh, the ones I initially liked are gonna become the ones I like least. Yep. You know? and, 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 that's, and that's what time with a record will, will, will do for you, yeah. Um, yeah, you gotta give it some time. Yep. Okay, so next question. This is from an anonymous attendee, and they ask, has Robert read Ross Johnson's new memoir? Would love to know his thoughts on Ross and his role in Memphis. I'm a huge Ross Johnson fan. Um, I have read the memoir and it's great. It's called uh, uh, Baron of Love, Moral Giant. It's on Space Case Records or books, you know. Encourage everyone listening to go immediately and buy a copy. Um, Ross, <laughs> boy, where do you even start? Ross was the drummer in the Panther Burns. Um, which is how I initially knew who he was. And then he had a radio show on the local uh, community station. And I tuned into that and that's when I became friends with him. Turned out he'd married like a childhood friend of mine. And, um, and his daughter and my daughters are best friends. And so I can't see Ross enough. And I think Ross's improvisational sense of humor, you know, Ross's improvisational records, which is, there's a, a Ross uh, cut on like Flies on Sherbert. It opens the album, Baron of Love, you know, it's, and it's kind of a made up thing on, on the spot. And it's evidence that, you know, Ross's uh, uh, chops for impromptu um, irascibility and uh, uh, what would it be? Shaping irascible, impromptu whatever uh is up there with you know jack kerouac and steve allen and pharaoh sanders you know check it out ross has an album out called uh make it stop <laughs> and and i recommend the ross johnson album make it stop <laughs> make it stop all right okay next question um my mom gave me this book the summer I returned from my freshman year in college, and it did change my life. Oh, I, cool. read it, I read it while waiting in the courthouse in Memphis because my mom was suing Kroger, and I had to be there to testify. I read suing who? Kroger. Kroger the store? That's what it, that's, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, and uh, let's see, I recommended it to the stenographer because I thought she was hot. <laughs> 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 well, okay. What were your wildest expectations in terms of success before it came from Memphis? Uh, did you ever imagine it would revitalize as many careers of nearly bygone local heroes as it did? No, you know, re revitalizing careers wasn't a thought for me at all at the time because in Memphis, these people, <laughs> They had careers. They played at the Antenna Club, you know? I was, I was like a kid going to the Antenna Club and seeing these people and wondering, hmm, why isn't it full here? You know, it's, this is amazing. And so, uh, you know, my expectations, I remember my parents asked me, uh, who's gonna read this book? You know, I think they were impressed I had a book contract, but you know, they didn't, understand the book. How could they understand the book? I didn't understand the book, you know? I was just like writing what I saw. And um, and uh, they said, who's gonna read it? And I said, rockers, you know? And uh, it's funny now to, to because I, I, I remember that as my literal answer. And it's funny to hear that now and think like, you know, rockers. If I told my, my you know, young 20s daughters, rockers you know what what would they even think what's a rock what rocking chairs are gonna listen are gonna read this book you know i i just wanted to reach people who who were open to not being into the most popular thing you know this was a book about what's not most popular excellent 
Next question from Pat Rayner. She asks, or he asks, is there going to be a soundtrack for the revised edition of It Came From Memphis? Not that I'm aware of, uh, which was initially disappointing, but I gotta say, I don't mind putting that, uh, I've done, I did three soundtracks to the first, you know, three prior It Came From Memphis soundtracks. Um, the third one being a double disc thing in England. We, they, they, the Barbican Center over there did a uh, like month long tribute to Memphis called It Came From Memphis that I curated for them. It was really great. Um, and there was that double disc, but man, those things are really hard to put together. The Memphis Rent Party LP, really hard to put together, lots of work. So I, was, I would have done it in a heartbeat, but um, there wasn't, you know, third man didn't leap at it and I was like okay cool man let's not, I'll take a I'll take a rest on this one a lot of a lot of working parts to track down for that it is it's so it gets really complicated and you know I love them and I love each record has like a song that is only that is the reason for that record like the Memphis Rent Party LP uh Alex Chilton's uh Johnny Too Bad it was like if I can clear, if I can get permission to put Johnny Too Bad on this LP, I will do it. And so it was the first thing I cleared. You know, Alex's sister said, okay. I was like, great. Then let's make this, then if I can get Johnny Too Bad out in the world, it's worth all the trouble to make this record. Very cool. Next question. Uh, everyone talks about how things change. Since this era you documented in the book, how has Memphis stayed the same? Well, it's still pretty, you know, the provincial nature of Memphis is inescapable. But what's changed over time is that that the city as a whole has become much more open and much more cultured, I think. Uh, you know, and, and, and cultured means has become accepting of the culture around it, has accepted black people, has accepted the art of black people, has accepted um, the music and the influence of black people. And that's been, you know, that was a long, hard battle. And when I was a kid, that the, I was experiencing the end of that battle. Um, and, I, and I think that battle still goes on here today, you know, very strongly. The hate in Memphis, hey, we, you know, I think the hate, I think a lot of the great art came about because of the hate, in, in response to the hate. Uh, um, and I think that the, in the general quotient of the Memphis, uh, equation, there's less hate, and that's the change, and it's good. Very cool. So, last question we have up here on the screen is when is Jim uh, when is Jim Blake going to open his archive? Unfortunately, Jim Blake passed away. Uh, what are we in early November? But uh, less than a month ago, you know. Um, Jim Blake was a guy who uh, who had a, a label called Barbarian Records, and he had a bunch of uh, underground newspapers in Memphis. And his thing with Barbarian Records was to record giants and midgets, transsexuals. Uh, I think he claims the first gay disco record. You know, all this is like 1970s stuff that he was putting out as vinyl 45s. And over time, and 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 Blake, uh, you know, Blake was Blake was one of Dickinson's mentors. In 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 inherited the mantle of corralling chaos to good effect. But these collector guys like to you know hold what they have, and. Um, Blake put out, I think, eight 45s in the 70s and 80s and, and continued to record from then to now and, and never could allow himself to release anything else. 
and upon and not long after his death, um, his daughter, the barbarian heiress, uh, inherited the tapes, and I think you know intends to unleash upon the world the barbarian archives. So we have that to look forward to. You know, it, it is, and, and I think it will be a great tribute to the mind and spirit of Jim Blake, this, you know, this uh, lone guy in the corner of the world doing it his way, you know, despite, hell no, you can't have my records. You don't deserve them. You know, that's, 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 the, that's like the, the spirit. you don't deserve my records world. So uh, I think the world, the world may not yet deserve them, but the world may finally get them. So I'm, I'm optimistic that come 2021, or soon thereafter, um, we will get, begin to get a sense of what Blake has created over time. I can't wait for that. Yeah, <laughs> that man, sounds, that sounds amazing. That's one more, one more of those uh, shadows in, in, the, in the Memphis landscape that someone needs to cast a light on. Yeah, um, definitely, definitely. Very cool. Well, with that, we can go ahead and wrap it up. Um, Acapella Books has copies of the book available with uh, book plates that Robert has been kind enough to sign. And uh, they're on the website, www.acapellabooks.com. Um, so with that, Robert, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Love the book. Thank you, thank you Chad, man. Really great questions. Really fun to go all these places. Acapella Books in Atlanta. So much fun for you to have me back on. I mean, to have me on, I wish I could be there in your back room, toasting everybody and hosting questions like we did for Memphis Rent Party and other books. But uh, the, the, the Zoom is a cool thing and world out there. Check out the Acapella Books website. And soon, soon we'll have you back. Thank you, Chad. Thank you, Acapella. Thank, thanks again. Bye. Bye-bye.